Hi, this is Jessica Damasa with WTF Health. I'm here at Webit in Sofia, Bulgaria, and joining me now I have Sri Iyengar. He is a serial entrepreneur who's built and exited several successful companies. Um, the first one was really cool. You actually developed the first ever medical device that could be integrated into an iPhone, right. and it was a glucometer. Yep. So talk to me a little bit about your experience there. What was that like, I guess, the process that you went through yep. to convince Apple to let you do this, and oh what can God. other entrepreneurs <laughs> <laughs> who are now in this health tech space learn from your, your experience yeah, there? So it was funny, because we, 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 we were making more traditional glucometers for a number of years, and then when the iPhone came out, we said, well, we should marry these two together, because you know one of the big uh, challenges in healthcare is what do you do with the information and the data? You know, people would, would prick their finger, get a drop of blood, get their glucose measurement, not, not, not know what to do with it. Yeah. So when the iPhone came out, we're like, well, we can take this and we can marry it together, and you can have trend information, you can look at historicals, you can do statistics, you can do wonderful things with it. And this was what year? Uh, so we, we started developing it in 2008, and, okay. uh, and we launched it in 2010. Okay. Uh, and it was with uh, Sanofi. Sanofi was our global partner uh, for that product. But and you know we, we, we made this device, and um, you know we were working with Apple, and we thought it'd be fantastic. And uh, they started asking us all these questions, and we turned around to them and said, "Well, sh shouldn't you know the answer to this? Because you're Apple." And finally, they kind of you know showed their cards a little bit and said, "Well, we've never done medical before, and you're the first to actually we're letting to connect." And we said, "Okay, we get it." So they're like, "Yeah, don't screw this up." <laughs> and, and and we thought um, working with the FDA would be difficult, and boy. Apple is a whole other story. Really? Why? Um, well, first of all, Apple, uh, at, the, at the time Steve Jobs was still alive, and, and Apple, uh, Steve in particular, didn't want the iPhone to tr be considered a medical device by the FDA. Okay. And so we had to be very, very careful on how we uh, designed the product, both from the functionality standpoint, regulatory standpoint, and UI standpoint, so that the iPhone would not be considered a medical accessory by the FDA. Okay. And, uh, and when I say Apple was more difficult to work with, it's it's a, kind of a tongue-in-cheek, um, uh, uh, um, you know, a viewpoint because when the FDA rejects you, they have to tell you why. When Apple says no, <laughs> they don't got to tell you jack. <laughs> and so you know, we had to figure out why they said no because a lot of times they won't tell you why because it's kind of secretive. And so we finally understood what what, what the motivation was was we had to make sure that they were not that the, if the iPhone was an FDA cleared medical device, then every iOS update, every firmware update, every app would have to kind of go through the FDA. Okay. And Apple's like, yeah, you're not no, going to do that. Yeah. It. So it took us about, I think, seven, eight months, uh, but we finally convinced them and it was it was a fantastic experience. Well, they're like still kind of flirting in and out of healthcare, although now they've got some really, some real good traction with now their new... Now it's a whole, whole other ballgame. I mean, basically it took FDA about five years to clarify their guidance on, on mobile health and digital apps and all that. So now they've opened up the door and it's, 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 it's great for the whole, for the whole community. All right, so give me some some good advice for digital health startups or health tech startups that are out there. All right, I'm probably going to get shot for saying this, uh -oh. but, um, <laughs> I but I love any answer that starts that way. <laughs> well, um, so I've been involved a number of uh, with a number of um, digital health companies, both you know as an operating uh, person, but also as an advisor, mentor, and uh, an investor. And the one thing that I that I've noticed um, is that the most successful digital health startups have not invented a single thing. <laughs> They haven't. The <laughs> least successful ones have come up with fantastic innovations that the FDA says, great, um, we need 10 years of clinical data before we can let you get that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what I say about, uh, what I mean by um, uh, most successful uh, yeah, that companies. didn't invent anything. Yeah. What are they selling then? Yes. So what they've done is they've taken existing models of care and existing models of delivery, and they've basically looked at all the inefficiencies in it, and they've written software or come up with better user interfaces to lower to, to remove that friction. So they basically lower the cost of delivery of, of existing models of care because those existing models of care have a history of reimbursement, they have a history of distribution, they have a history of CPT codes and everything. So yeah. you don't want to reinvent all of that. The infrastructure is there, you just need to find the path and then um, write good products and good software to, to, to remove that friction. So, Do you think in there's, there's any way that technology is failing healthcare these days? So um, I'm a big infrastructure guy. I, I, I love looking at what platform can you build so that new things can be built on top of that. And to me, I think the way that new therapies are, are invented, like new drugs, new materials, how, how are these things invented? So the, the process of invention, I think, uh, needs a bit of an overhaul. And, and that's kind of been my life's work, is that you know, how do you take something that's 
kind of existing and inefficient, but how do you invent the next thing beyond that? So whether it's it's new medical devices or whether it's wearables or now what, what I'm doing now with my, with my new company is building the tools so that the process of scientific discovery can be de-risked much earlier. Okay, talk and, more about that. What does that mean? So what that means is, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you, you know, I, I knew lots of people in, 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 in universities and in labs and in, 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 uh, researchers that had amazing inventions, amazing new scientific discoveries, but they couldn't spin it out. They couldn't turn it into a company or a product because they couldn't raise money for it. Okay. It was a science project. There was no way that, it, that venture community would actually invest in it. Now, look at, look what we have now. We have artificial meat. <laughs> you, yeah. right. you, 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 have, you have like burgers being grown in labs, okay? You have new materials that are being, you, you have CRISPR technologies that you can, you can actually get rid of diseases by, by actually cutting it out. Cutting it out. <laughs> Bingo. 15 years ago, these companies would have to raise 50, 60 million dollars as their first round of investment. Now, they can do it with 2 million. And the reason for that is the infrastructure to invent is much more robust now. So you can de-risk scientific experiments. You can get very rapid feedback. The computation power today in the cloud is, is orders of magnitude more, more powerful and, and less expensive than it was a decade ago. So the idea that new inventions are now coming to light solely because of the infrastructure that's built around them is super exciting for me, so, yeah. Okay, I want your opinion on the infrastructure in healthcare, because this seems to be like a global problem where it's just, yeah. people are like, I, we, you know, we need to just completely start over. Is it salvageable? Can we, can, we, can we truly innovate in healthcare on the infrastructure that we have in place here now? So, uh, there's not a simple answer, uh, but if I look at the infrastructure, th there's one end, which is the data side, which is how do you make machines talk to each other, how do you make data records talk to each other, and people are working on that, people are absolutely working on that. But the, the real infrastructure problem is the financial infrastructure and the financial incentives, because the way that, you know, you, you've got, you got the, the uh, the the the, um, the therapeutic companies, the pharmaceutical companies. You've got the payers. You've got the providers. You've got the PBMs. So everything is locally optimized. And nobody has globally optimized it. In order to do that, you do you you, you didn't literally need an act of Congress to do that, which may or may not happen in, in the near future. But what what I do see happening is people are skirting the issue because. What's happening is now with something like um, CRISPR technologies, you, you can actually change the DNA in your cells, and what that means is the cost of delivering that care just plummeted, right. because you don't need to go through all decades of all, all that anymore. So, what, what, so what we see is that the the uh, the new science and new technologies that are coming to market, or they're being showcased, they haven't yet come to market, yet, but they're being showcased, are actually driving the FDA and the regulators to adopt them faster, and once that happens then the insurance companies, the payers are going to look at that and say, wait a minute, this is a far more financially, you know, accept, you know, a financially better, better path. So technology lowers the financial friction and that aligns financial incentives with technology incentives. So I see it happening, yeah. but it's being led by the, by, the, by the tech side of things. Okay, so I always like people to ask people, what's the future? So what I guess are you most excited about? Infrastructure guy, technology guy, science guy, what are you most excited about for the future? And it doesn't have to just be in health, I'm just, I'm curious. So, uh, material science. Okay. So, I, again, you know, I, I, coming out of a background of engineering and biochemistry, I look at that and say, you know, biochemistry is nothing more than a different way of conveying information. You can, you can, you can actually take a lot of information science and apply it to how chemistry and, and biology is actually being performed. And that gives you the basis for using cells as the factories of the future. So there's this new um, phrase uh, that I've heard recently called cellular agriculture. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so that's basically using cells to create food. Okay. So uh, lab-grown meat is one of them, and also things like, uh, you know, um, dairy products. So you can you can make a milk without cows. You can make eggs without chickens. You can make beef without cows now. And so what you end up doing is you're you're, you're looking at how do you grow cells and how do you use cellular processes to actually generate new materials. So proteins. The proteins are the building blocks uh, of life. Right. So there's, there's an amazing company out on the, uh, in San Francisco called Bolt Threads. And what they do is they take the, the DNA from, uh, uh, they, they take spider silk DNA, stick it into you know, bacteria or yeast, and they grow it out. And so now you can express silk, not without silkworms or spiders, but, but with cells. And that lowers the cost of manufacturing. So, you know, animals were just a very inefficient way to manufacture stuff. Whether <laughs> so now you have cellular, cellular manufacturing, cellular agriculture, and that requires a ton of new infrastructure, new sensors, new analytics, new material, like 
the entire field needs infrastructure, and that gets me really excited. I love it. Your enthusiasm is contagious, and thank you for introducing us to that new term, cellular agriculture. I love that. That's the first time I've heard that. Very cool. Shri, it was such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. I'm Jessica DeMassa here at Webbit for WTF Health. Thanks so much for joining us.